God, help us to hear your word. Let it change and transform our lives. Thank you. Amen. And help us to be in your timing. Amen. I ask that because uh, some, there are lots of things that happen that have nothing to do with signs. They're not a sign, they're just a random occurrence. So some people attribute random occurrences to the status of a sign. And sometimes people see signs and they completely miss it. They think, oh, that's a random occurrence. So you can miss it on either way. All I can tell you is that the clocks around here have been going crazy the last couple of weeks. So, uh, so I'm just praying that we be in God's timing. Now, maybe it was just random occurrence that the, all the clocks, not all of them, but half of them, started going, having issues. And maybe it was not a sign. In which case, it doesn't hurt to ask to be in the center of God's timing, right? But if it was a sign, we certainly want to adjust our clocks to God's clock. God, help us to be in your timing. Thank you. Amen. Ephesians 3. God, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. That's difficult to imagine all by itself, because some of you are really good at asking. Uh, some of you noticed Roman here. He is really good at asking. Because he doesn't say, he doesn't take a no. And he's been with that uh, for as long as I can remember that he's had the power of speech. He is adamant to get whatever it is that he's after. And he'll ask, and you can say whatever you want, but if you say no, he'll ask again. And again, and again. And some of you are really good at asking, and uh, others of you are good at imagining. God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Now, one of the amazing things of that was in the, we've already read, but uh, it just went by some people. God, by the power at work within us. Some people, when they... Um, want something to happen, imagine that God's going to have to accomplish things by really changing the landscape around us. But Ephesians says that a lot of the times the change that comes, it's by the power at work within us. That we ourselves accomplish the kinds of things that we can't even imagine or dream of. Because God's power is resident within us. That it's our doing. God's doing through us that accomplishes far more than we can imagine or dream. That's an amazing, wonderful promise. When we last left Zechariah, the priest Zechariah, not the prophet, but the priest Zechariah, he was unable to speak. The angel had come to him and said, you know that dream that you had when you were in your 20s that you and your wife would have a child and then you prayed about it because it wasn't happening? And then you waited, and then decades went by, and you gave up on it. Well, that promise, that prayer, God said yes to that. And Zachariah said, I'm old. My wife is getting on in years. How can I know that you're telling me the truth? Now, Zechariah was talking to the angel in the place where almost nobody ever went. It was... Uh, place where they offered incense on the altar to God and the priest was chosen to go into that place by lot. So you might go through a whole lifetime as a priest and never, and never be able to go in there. But you might just by chance have your name drawn and go in there on a particular day. And when Zechariah went in there he discovered he wasn't alone. There was someone else in there, a messenger from God. And uh, when he wasn't Believing what the messenger told him, that he was going to have a baby, the messenger said, uh, he said, what, Zechariah told the messenger, what will you do that will help me believe your promise? And the messenger said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You're not going to be able to speak until this comes true. And he wasn't able to speak. He also wasn't able to tell his wife about it initially because he was on duty for a while as a priest. So he had to stay where he was and fulfill his obligation before he could get home. 
And then he was quiet for at least nine months. And had nine months to think about it. And at some point, his wife became pregnant, and so the clock started ticking on the nine months that he knew that he'd be able to speak. And I'm going to make a guess, and it may not be how it happened. But I guess that Zechariah was waiting to be able to speak when his son was born. And maybe that's not how it happened, but when his son was born, he still wasn't able to speak. I'm guessing that that day he thought, all right, this is the day, and it wasn't. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives rejoiced with her, the text says. So here's the things the angel had said would have to happen. You and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You will name him John. He, you will have joy and gladness. That had happened. Many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. That had happened. Even before his birth, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. That had happened. With the power of Elijah, he will go before the Lord to make his people... Uh-oh. Does Zechariah have to wait until his son grows up and fulfills his mission before he can start to talk? That's going to be a longer wait than just nine months. If I'm right in my guess, Zachariah had a few days to think about it. And then came the day of circumcision. In uh, Israel, it happened on the eighth day. And so the baby was named on the eighth day. And the friends and relatives came in and said, Okay, we're naming your baby Zachariah. And Elizabeth said, No. His name's John. And all the friends and relatives uh, said, Oh, you can't do that. I don't know if you've got family like that. <laughs> they, don't ha they, have, they don't have enough trouble running their own life, so they think they should run yours too. Uh, well, that's the kind of friends and family that... You know, she'd waited decades for a baby. You'd think they'd let her at least, you know, but no. They wanted to run her life, and so they announced the name, and she said no, and they wouldn't take her word for it. It was her baby, but it didn't matter. So they, and Zachariah couldn't speak, so they gave him a writing tablet. Old man, what do you say? And he wrote down, his name is John. And at that point, he was able to speak. The promise was, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And luckily, that's as much as he had to wait for before he could speak. If you had a nine month or longer, one year, something like that, time out, where you could just think about what your next words might be, and especially if you'd had an extra bonus eight days in there after the birth of your son, up to the time of announcing his name, to think about it, you probably would have something amazing to say, and that was the case for the priest, who is not the prophet Zechariah, but announced a pretty spectacular prophecy. The priest, as he was talking about his son, first ignored his son, and started talking instead about Jesus. God has raised up for us a mighty Savior in the house of his servant David. And after an amazing testimony about Jesus, then Zechariah turned to his son and said, and, and you are going to prepare the way for this Savior who is to come. I don't know what Robin feels like about being part of Batman and Robin. Uh, and there are plenty of people who are sidekicks or the, the power behind the scenes. And in some cases, the power behind the scenes really likes to not be the upfront person. Uh, in other cases, the um, number two person 
would just as soon be number one. Pepsi doesn't like being a sidekick to Coke. And that's true for some people. John the Baptist, his whole life was to announce Jesus and to point to Jesus and get out of the way when Jesus came on the scene. His followers said, Oh, no, 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 you've got a great ministry. This is, all, this is really good. We should... John said, No, I'm here to announce Jesus. Zachariah, his father, knew it even at the birth and naming of his son. His son, Jesus announced, was maybe one of the most important people ever. John the Baptist was one of the most important people ever. But his purpose was to announce Jesus. Okay, God, here's a prophecy. God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. There's a number of things that you can pick up from this message and meditate on, but one of the most hopeful ones is this. God has far more in mind for you than you probably guess or imagine or ask for. And the promises of God are probably far greater than you imagine. Zechariah announces, Jesus' purpose is we're going to be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And you know that among the people who heard it, they're probably people who behaved like Jesus' disciples and said, oh, that's so good because the Romans have been occupying Israel for far too long. We're glad that we're going to get rid of those enemies. And that's not what Jesus did. God has far more in mind. What God had in mind was not... I mean, the, the oppression of Rome was... It was too bad. But what God was interested in was setting people from the oppression of death and the oppression of the devil and the oppression of sin. And, and when God sent Jesus to set us free from our enemies, God had in mind not the petty little enemies that you think of throughout the day, your co-workers, your boss, whoever it is. God was setting you free from people and beings that you never consider from invisible principalities and powers that you're not even aware of that are plotting your demise and trying to strangle your destiny. God set us free from death and sin and the power of the devil. God is far more in mind than you guess. So here's how it works in a quick history of things. First, there's the petition. Some cases the petition comes from us, some cases it comes from God. Often God looks at civilization and says, that cannot go on. Sometimes we look at the way things are going and say, this isn't right. This is not the way it was meant to be. God, would you do something about it? So the first there's a petition, and sometimes immediately, sometimes after a while, there's the response of God, which is the promise. This is not how it's going to end. Something better is coming. There is a new day. After the promise, there's often a pause. You have the promise, you just don't see it. Jesus is coming back. And 2,000 years later, Jesus is coming back. But in between, there's a pause. Sometimes the pause is long, 2,000 years. Sometimes it's short. But there's usually always a pause between the promise first there was the petition can't we have a baby and then they got the promise decades later yes you're going to have a you're going to have a son you're going to name him John and then there was a pause before anything happened and once the pause was over then the pregnancy began when Elizabeth became pregnant John wasn't on the scene but they knew that the baby was coming because she was pregnant. There's a time when God's promises are being fulfilled, but there's only a couple people who know it because they're pregnant with the promise. After the pregnancy, 
the baby's born, and it doesn't look anything like the promise. You have in mind that all of the Sudan will be freed from warfare, and you're working on that, but currently what you're working on is so tiny that nobody notices. It's just in one tiny little village, and it doesn't seem to be having much of an impact there. But it's the baby that will grow into what will be helpful. So when Jesus is born, John the Baptist is born, when Jesus is born, people are thinking, all right, the Messiah is here, but he's pooping his diapers and he's crying all night. And, and it's a long time before the little baby grows into anything that could become a Messiah. There's a time of preparation. There's a time when Jesus didn't know how to talk, and he had to be trained. There's a time when Jesus didn't know how to walk. He had to be trained. There's a time when Jesus didn't know right from wrong, presumably, and he had to be trained. Now, some of you might think Jesus knew right from wrong all along. Fine. But the walking part, no. Jesus had to be trained. There's a time of preparation. I ran out of peas. <laughs> then there's a time of fulfillment. So for Jesus, the time between the promise and fulfillment, there is the, po the, the promise for many of the early people in Israel happened centuries before Jesus was born. When Jesus was finally born, Mary and Joseph pregnant, time of preparation, 30 years. Mary and Joseph know. But Herod thinks he's gotten rid of the baby. There's lots of people on the world scene that for that 30, first 30 years of Jesus' life, they think the Messiah is still not coming when the Messiah was growing up right in their midst. But it was preparation. Then there's a time of fulfillment. Time when Jesus is doing ministry and at the end of his life when he dies on the cross and fulfills everything. At the time of fulfillment, it can look like nothing good has happened. Jesus died on the cross and accomplished God's purpose that you would be set free from your enemies, from the enemies of sin, death, and the devil. But for people looking at Jesus dying on the cross, it looked like his, this eternal kingdom they'd been promised, it was now over before it started. When fulfillment happens, a lot of times it doesn't look anything like you were expecting. And fulfillment sometimes is in a package that you don't even recognize. And the way it often works according to Ezekiel is that there's a little bit of water trickling out of the altar. And it goes in a long ways out. It's actually grown. But it's still only ankle high. And if you go way farther out, it's up to your knees. And if you go way further out, it's up to your hips. And if you go further out from there, it gets so deep you can't cross it. There is a time of fulfillment, and it's sometimes after Jesus Christ is crucified, it takes a while for the world to catch up and realize what has been accomplished, that by His stripes you are healed. Isaiah prophesied it. The promise happened centuries before Jesus fulfilled it. But even after Jesus fulfilled it, there's a long time before people realize, oh, that was far more significant than I thought it was. This pattern that I'm showing you, an example of the lives of John the Baptist and of Jesus, is how it will work in your life too. So you can hit a time of fulfillment and not recognize that it's actually fulfilled. But afterwards, there is a time of overflow where the meaning becomes more and more clear and more and more apparent. And the last one on my list is recognition, which can happen at any one of these stages. At the state of petition, before anything has happened, someone can recognize God is all-powerful. There's no way this is going to last. God's going to take care of it. At the time of the promise, 
people can recognize this is a done deal. I may not see it in my days, but God is going to fulfill the, His word. And other people are saying, you believe that there's going to be justice? Look around you. Can't you read a newspaper? Some people are able to recognize it in the pregnancy or in the preparation. When Jesus was circumcised, man holding that little baby had had a promise to him that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. And holding Jesus at eight days old, he said, God, you fulfilled your promise to me. He's looking at Jesus, who's still in the stage of crying and looking like he's smiling when he really has gas. And he is able to see in this baby the Messiah. You can recognize God and God's purposes at any stage. And the opposite of that, you cannot recognize at any stage. Even down to the stage of overflow, there will be people who do not ever recognize what Jesus has done for them. Even when it's clear to all creation, falling on its knees, bowing before Jesus. When would you like to recognize Jesus? When would you like to recognize God's power and promise in your life? God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than you can ask or imagine. Oh, you know what, God? I'm going to start believing that when I see the overflow. Okay? You're going to miss out on a whole lot of years of joy that you could have had rejoicing when you saw the promise, the pause, the pregnancy, the preparation, and the fulfillment before you got to the overflow. We're going to take a moment for prayer. Prayer is this, God asks forgiveness for all I've done wrong. Help me to do what's good. I accept Jesus as my Lord. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, if that fits for you, we'll ask you to join us uh, while we pray. We'll have everybody stand. Ready? God, I ask forgiveness for all I've done wrong. Help me to do what's good. I accept Jesus as my Lord. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen.